going on, everybody? Welcome inside the Nittany Lions Sports Report live here on Bob Long Sports from our Bluebell Studios. Bob Long, Tyler Gelhouse, and Tyler, boy, it just doesn't seem like it's been nine months since we did this. It's great to have you back in the studio and uh, another season for the Nittany Lions is upon us. Yeah, another season, definitely the best time of year for sports, um, football. It's second to none in America. Um, we all love our football, and it's uh, it's a quick three month season that we we wait, as you said, nine months for. But here we are back at it with another season. Uh, twenty nineteen starts now. A little bit different this year in terms of how we're going to run this thing. The biggest thing was Tyler's idea, and so excited to debut it here tonight. And that's a live on camera in studio guest picker, and it's going to be somebody throughout the Philadelphia area, most likely that has some kind of cool story, something that they're doing in the community that we're going to highlight for about five minutes and then spend the last five minutes of the show making picks, having a good time. And the winner over the course of 12, 13, no matter how many weeks we end up doing this, if Penn State goes all the way into early January, we'll be doing it till then. They're going to get some Bob Long Sports swag courtesy of us here. So we're excited for that one. And our first guest tonight is Tyler Kern, the color commentator for the LaSalle College High School football program. He calls those games alongside me, a great colleague of mine. We're going to recap their game against Imhotep, a big win against a strong Imhotep team, and get Tyler's picks on the big games across college football. But that's the end of the show. And the beginning of the show is, I think, what the folks are dialing in for about now, Tyler. It's what is this team going to be? We see a lot of changes over the offseason with transfers, with newcomers, a very young roster, and we'll have a blitz segment up on the whiteboard shortly where we're kind of going through the depth chart. But what do you think about how everything transpired, putting it into a nice little package, quarterback departs, Tommy Stevens, Sean Clifford just recently gets awarded the starting position, a myriad of running backs, four guys listed as oars, on the depth chart and a young wide receiver core. Yeah, I think that this was probably one of the most bizarre off seasons um, outside of, of 2012, and we all know what happened then. But um, with with transfers, just guys that are leaving the program and outside people, um, you know, were saying, "Oh, there, there's a problem at Penn State." You know, this guy's leaving, this guy's leaving, this guy's leaving. Well, if you look at who really left, it's a lot of um, redshirt seniors. The majority are graduate transfers. Who you see a guy like Juwan Johnson transfer to Oregon. I mean, is it a writing on the wall type of thing that you know it's time? It's time to get out. These younger guys are going to start passing. I think that is. Um, I think that same holds true um, with the quarterback situation. Situation, although maybe a little different um, because there was an injury uh, with Tommy Stevens. It required surgery and and so on, and he didn't play in the blue white game. And that's a long story, but. Essentially, the transfers, the offseason that was, I think it bettered this team, and there's there's a lot of talent on this team. People just don't really know about it. A lot of young talent, Bob. So it's, it should be interesting to see how these young guys fare, and if they want if they want to take this thing to the next level, it's going to come down to the quarterback as well as the O-line play, in my opinion, because all the other pieces are there. The O-line certainly is something that I think a lot of people – uh, are keeping a close eye on and for the exactly the right reason. Last year was the year of continuity. Last year was the year that Connor McGovern, Ryan Bates, and Steven Gonzalez and those guys, Michael Mennett, right? This was a line that was essentially all there the year prior. And it was guys that hadn't quite hit the potential. 2018 was supposed to be the year. Right. It just wasn't. And so now what you have is a younger group. Rasheed Walker is a redshirt freshman going to get the start. Will Fries, who's a redshirt junior, but he seems like a senior at this point, right? right? He's been playing for so long. Mike Miranda is going to be backing up at both guards positions. C.J. Thorpe, who had a cup of coffee on the defensive line, is now going to start on the offensive line. And really, uh, Michael Mennett being that rock, I think, of this group, a much younger group. Right. But – Roll the dice a little bit because things didn't work out very well last year. The other thing I want to take a look at over the course of this year, Tyler, among other things, is the development of Ricky Ronnie as a play caller. Because last year, I think he had stages where he made some good decisions, but overall there were also times where you were left scratching your head and often in big moments. Fourth and five, Ohio State. Yep, among others, but right. that's the one that sticks Correct. out. And so I think that's very important as well. What's Ricky Ronnie's? role going to be we know he's going to be the offensive play caller but uh, does he continue 
to mature? Does he develop his own system? In some ways, what we saw as far back as the Fiesta Bowl against Washington, he was kind of mimicking what we saw with Joe Moorhead, who revolutionized that offense over the two years he was here. I want to see Ricky Ronnie, of course, continue to incorporate those principles, but I want him to develop his own identity as an offensive coordinator. I, and, and you're 100% right about that. I mean, he, this is, in my opinion, a make-or-break year for, for um, Ronnie as the offensive coordinator. I mean, he has the pieces to the puzzle. He's just got to p- put those pieces together now. I mean, young, young, skilled guys, but the most talent – really since they won the Big Ten, and this team could actually have more, better talent outside of Saquon Barkley, of course. I mean, this team is loaded on offense at all the skill positions. I mm-hmm. mean, tight end, you have Friar Muth and Bowers, probably one of the best duos in the country. Um, Receiver is a little unproven outside of Hamler, but you have Jahan Dotson's a sophomore. Justin Shorter, who we talked about earlier, is a redshirt freshman, was the number one receiver recruit um for 2017 he didn't he didn't live up to the hype last year was hampered by injuries here and there and just never really put it together last year but and even then you we haven't even talked about running back as you mentioned earlier on the depth chart was Ricky Slade or Journey Brown followed by another or and then you have Devin Ford and and um, Noah Kane two right. true freshmen so there are so many weapons there and that's why I believe that I, I actually have a lot of confidence in Clifford to make the right decisions from what I've seen so far at the end of the day, it is going to come down to Ronnie. It is going to come down to Clifford, and it is going to come down to the offensive line because they haven't progressed like we would have liked them to the last couple of years. Right. There are some new faces in there. Um, you know, it, they they need to get better because that's what wins games. And and I I'm very confident on the other side of the ball on the line. But the offensive line is a huge huge question mark, and they the team, in my opinion, will go as far as they take them. From a scheduling perspective, Penn State, whether they knew this was going to happen, certainly they did not. After the uh, after the blue-white game, I think Tommy Stevens took everybody by surprise. That said, I think the schedule sets up brilliantly for the events that transpired over the course of the offseason, Tyler. Idaho, an FCS team that wasn't over 500 last year. Buffalo can be a difficult team out of the MAC, but a game that you expect to win at home. Pittsburgh, I think, is down. I think that's a chance to be a real blowout this year. Maryland, Friday night game, that is their Super Bowl. Post post buy too. Um, talk about the schedule. There are two buys this year. Yep. It is a funny schedule, and that is post buy for both teams, actually, I believe. Right. So, uh, yes, Friday night, College Park. And that's going to be a big thing for the fans at College Park and for the Maryland faithful. I tend to think, and perhaps you think back to a game in Piscataway a few years ago. Right, yeah. Right, Gary Nova leading the Rutgers team, a sloppy game that Penn State turned the ball over. 10 I think the final was. Yeah. yeah. And they forced a ton of turnovers from Nova and that Rutgers team. It was 13-10. to 10, And, uh, you know, could it be a game like that, or is this team a little bit more athletic? I mean, they're not more mature than that team was, but can they be – uh, a team where they can just out athlete that Maryland team. I like to think that they can in that game and that they improved to four and zero. You know, and then you're looking at Purdue, which is kind of a tweener game before you get into a big slate of going on the road to Iowa, playing Michigan State, Ohio State, Michigan. Of course, is the whiteout game. Those first three games I mentioned on the road. So again, if you are building in a redshirt sophomore it, it quarterback, good, it is a good. I agree. This is the type of schedule. To do that. You get on. Ohio State late, even though it's on the road, you catch them late, and that's before their game at Michigan. So, right. you know, you never know. And, and at that point of the year, hopefully, majority of the team is still healthy and, and they're hitting on all cylinders mm-hmm. because that could, be, that could be a huge game. Hopefully it will be. And who is Ohio State this year? A new quarterback, Justin Fields, who came by way of Georgia, who came by way of an initial commitment to Penn State, right. of course. And a guy that couldn't win the job over Jake Fromm, I'm not going to knock him for that. Jake Fromm is a Heisman contender every year. But he fits pretty well on paper into that Ohio State system. Then again, Ryan Day, the new head coach, Urban Meyer out the door. Interesting to see what that team's going to look like. Interesting whether the door may be open for a team like Michigan State that returns a whole bunch of starters on their offense and a team like Michigan, who just hasn't been able to get over the hump. They lost a lot defensively, right. Tyler, but offensively, a name that Penn State fans will recognize, Josh Gaddis now calling the plays in Ann Arbor. 
that offense for the first time we're talking about Michigan as potentially an offensive juggernaut in the Big Ten. Does Ohio State take the foot off the gas pedal with the change at the top? Yeah, it's something that's really interesting this year. I mean, we the, the Big Ten is top-heavy on the East, as we all know. Um, Michigan State, Penn State, Michigan, or Ohio State, frankly, any of those four teams can win it. When you look to the West, there's four teams that can probably win it too. They're just not that strong as strong as those teams. You have Iowa, Nebraska now, um, Northwestern, and even a team uh, potentially like Purdue or Minnesota. Uh, but with that being said, we, you know the East is Penn State's priority, winning the East, getting to Indianapolis for another Big Ten championship, and it is wide open. I mean, there are a lot of unknowns from Penn State on Michigan State, on Michigan and Ohio State. There are a lot of unknowns. It should be. It should make for a great year for, for Big Ten football. I think it will be. This is the Nittany Lions Sports Report, Bob Long, Tyler Gelhouse. We'll have our guest picker coming up as we approach the hour of eight here in the East. Tyler Kern will join us from LaSalle College High School Football Broadcast live on Bob Long Sports. Next game is Friday against North Penn. But we're talking Penn State football here. A lot to get to up next is the Blitz, which is our weekly whiteboard segment. We're going to go through the depth chart item by item, highlight the strengths, where the team may have some weaknesses, and where the biggest growth can come over the course of the year. We'll be right back, everybody. Thanks for being with us. And you're watching us live here on Twitter and Facebook, live on Bob Long Sports. Ford is Mayfair's neighborhood Ford store. Nobody knows your neighborhood like Dunphy Ford. Nearly 40 years. Right here on Frankfurt Avenue. Generation after generation, our neighbors continue to be our customers. We have access to the cars and trucks you want with financing you need. Dunphy Ford is Northeast Philly's first choice for America's number one brand. 7700 Frankfurt Avenue in Mayfair. Online at www.dumpyford.com. Come experience the Dumpy difference. You'll be glad you did. One of the most important relationships a business can have is with its commercial banker. This is Bob Long, and when I'm not broadcasting sports, I'm servicing my clients and building relationships with prospective clients. Whether now is the time to grow through capital investment, to drive operational efficiencies, or to leave a legacy through succession planning, I can be a resource to guide you through the process. Bob Long, a commercial banker in the greater Philadelphia area, where my goal is to help your business grow. What does your character look like? Does it bounce back after each setback? Does it stand out by standing up? Does it make good on good intentions? Character is invisible until it's not. Only through action will the world know what it's made of, what you're made of. Find out how you can strengthen the character of your community alongside empowered veterans and families of the fallen at travismanion.org. I chose CCM because I have found that this company, um, on the level of scaling that we have here, the volume that we are doing, to truly have every department head and employee fully engaged in the mission of the company to make it an originator focused, uh, production first uh, company. I have not found that anywhere I've worked and I've worked at one of the largest banks in the world down to the smallest tiny community bank and correspondent lender. No one has been able to consistently deliver that message. LaSalle is dynamic. Prepare. 
Welcome back, everybody. It's time for the Blitz here on the Nittany Lions Sports Report. Bob Long, Tyler Gellhouse. All right, we take you out of the whiteboard to break down the depth chart for Penn State. First and foremost, let's talk about the quarterback position. Sean Clifford, the start of this year, beating out Will Levis. It was somewhat of a formality once Tommy Stevens got out the door. When I think about Sean Clifford, he's a guy that stayed in the pocket last year, delivered balls down the field in limited opportunities, and did a great job at that. But let's not discount the dual threat that Sean Clifford actually is. I mean, let's think about it, right? When was he in the game? When Trace McSorley was hurt or the game was in hand? But Trace McSorley, somewhat of an injury-prone quarterback, puts himself in the line of fire. Tommy Stevens was hurt for the vast majority of the year. They put him in bubble wrap. Sean Clifford was in bubble wrap last year. This year, you're going to see a lot of that RPO-type stuff in addition to dropping straight back. But this is not a deviation or a total change from what you've seen from the Penn State offense in the past. He ran that RPO in high school. He is a mobile quarterback. So don't expect Clifford to be in the pocket throughout the majority of this year. From a running back position, I could put two, three, four. There's three guys with oars next to their name. Journey Brown is going to be listed, I think, by the time we get to the second or third game as the backup running back. And I think you're going to see Noah Cain getting, we'll say, third team snaps. I think this is Ricky Slade's job as long as he can hold on to the football. He's a guy that in his freshman year has had trouble fumbling the football, but there's a second-round pick playing for the Eagles right now who had the same type of issues in Miles Sanders. Slade, a guy that can catch the ball out of the backfield, continue to develop that part of his game. Blocking, good, but I think that's a, a really a part of his game where he can get a lot better and has worked hard in the offseason. And then Devin Ford is the fourth guy. And again, they're all listed as oars at this point. For me, the big thing Devin Ford-wise is that he didn't come in uh, over the winter, and he didn't spend the spring with the team. He didn't graduate early and come through. Noah Cain did, and Noah Cain being more of that physical back running downhill. Journey Brown can bounce it to the outside, and Ricky Slade a little bit of everything. Devin Ford, a strong back, and I think he's his patience, vision, and his footwork are going to help him in the long term. Uh, I think this could be one of those four-game redshirt seasons for Devin Ford unless something changed. Wide receiver position is very, very interesting, though. K.J. Hamler, I think, clearly is your number one, but he's going to run most of his packages out of the slot. And certainly there was a guy, John Donovan, that nobody wants to talk about uh, associated with Penn State. But think about the pit game. Think about a couple other opportunities where he gets the ball in the backfield, in space, dare I say jet sweep. I think he can be very effective getting into the middle of the defense, running a jet sweep, or, of course, can burn folks that really shouldn't be covering him, nickelbacks that might be covering him while he's in the slot. He's fantastic. Jahan Dotson, one of the better route runners that we've seen come through Penn State in a long time, and that's saying something. He had a great freshman year and I think is primed to take a, to take a big step forward. Uh, the guy that I'm worried about, and I want to hear Tyler's thoughts on this on the other side, is Justin Shorter a guy that certainly can play that true X or true Z at the wide receiver. He has that physicality build. He can run the sideline, be physical, but we just haven't heard a lot about him. Of course, he was banged up last year, but why haven't we heard more about Justin Shorter this year? It's a question I have, and I'm very interested to see what happens in the first two weeks. But now we'll talk about the offensive line, Rasheed Walker. Rasheed Walker is a redshirt freshman coming in and taking the most difficult job on the line, and that's left tackle, protecting the blind side of Sean Clifford. Interested to see what happens there. I think he has the chance to be very good, but 
the thing about these guys. We know so much about them as they're getting recruited, and then really the lid kind of closes. You know, we, we see glimpses at practice. We see glimpses at lift for life or different things like that. Rashid Walker, what has he done in a year and a half since he committed to Penn State and stepped on campus? That's what I'm really looking forward to. C.J. Thorpe, Michael Mennett, Stephen Gonzalez, and Will Fries across the line. Will Fries, a guy who's been there for a long time, got playing time as soon as his redshirt freshman year. He's all of a sudden a veteran on this offensive line. And this, everybody's saying it, but I can't disagree with them. This is the key for this Penn State team this year. Can they protect Sean Clifford? Can they allow the opportunities for these three very different running backs to find their hole, to run downhill, to bounce to the outside? You know, is C.J. Thorpe, certainly we know he's athletic enough to pull and play that guard position in a very athletic way. How is Ricky Ronnie's play calling going to interact with all that? There's a lot of moving pieces. It's a very young team, as we're going to see over the course of this year. But I think the offense has a chance to be very good this year. And on the defensive side of the ball, there's just not a lot to be concerned about here. Potentially injuries. We've seen Fred Hansert uh, had, have injuries. Antonio Shelton be a little banged up from time to time. But really, from a defensive end standpoint, doesn't really get better or deeper than what this team has. Ytre Gross Matos is a first-round pick next year. Shaka Tony is a guy that we've been waiting to build into a 240, 250-pound defensive end, and he's still working that way. I don't know that he's every down, but you have a guy like Jason Awe right behind him, guy that can pin his ears back. Shaka Tony looking in the mirror to some extent a few years ago. Shane Simmons as a backup. Wow. I mean, a guy who is big, strong, and can be an every down defensive end he's going to play behind gross matos or perhaps take snaps away from t from tony uh so good there antonio shelton and robert windsor uh up the middle at the interior d lines pj mustafer is a sophomore coming up behind him that's pretty deep as well damian barber people are saying good things about him as well i think he's that clear fourth on the peg but he's going to get some snaps and then the linebacker boy this is such an interesting discussion isn't it because one, Cam Brown is out for the first half against Idaho after the targeting penalty in the Kentucky game. But now you have Micah Parsons listed at Sam. You have Jesse Lucada at the will. And then Jan Johnson, of course, at the middle linebacker. So it begs the question, what happens when Cam Brown comes back? Well, as recently as true freshman year, we were talking about could Micah Parsons play middle linebacker. It became apparent that wasn't going to happen. Jan Johnson did have a good year last year. So I think that you're going to have Mike Parsons swing around to the will. Cam Brown's going to hang out here at the Sam, and, uh, and then Jan Johnson wraps up the spot at the middle linebacker. Something that I, I think is a very small issue because we're having Cam Brown then move ahead of Micah Parsons at the Sam and, and, uh, and him move to the will. But Charlie Katz here. Above Lance Dixon on the depth chart, which is essentially the third spot, but Micah Parsons, if there was an injury, would move back. So essentially fourth on the Sam depth chart. Just surprised to see the, the senior uh, taking over that spot over Lance Dixon, a guy that I thought really could be a big-time linebacker as soon as this year. Jan Johnson backed up by Ellis Brooks. And uh, Jesse Lakeda, I think, is going to bounce around from middle linebacker, but more so backing up Micah Parsons. And then the secondary, John Reed, Tariq Castro-Fields. Good to see Keaton Ellis, true freshman, be right behind John Reed on the depth chart. Uh, Joey Porter Jr. in there as well. Perhaps one of those guys are going to redshirt this year. Don't know who that would be, but my thought would be Porter, as I'm hearing that Keaton Ellis could be ready to get out there right away. And then possibly the biggest thing we were waiting for was who was going to fill out the safety position. Garrett Taylor, tremendous year last year. Was it going to be Lamont Wade, who made the position change two years ago, or Jaquan Brisker, who came from Lackawanna County Community College and was ready to go as soon as he came on campus? As I understand it, Brisker pushed him very hard, but Lamont Wade will start at that safety position this year. Uh, I think that's important, and uh, I think Brisker is going to be able to give those key minutes, but happy to see Lamont Wade, super recruit, a guy that was supposed to be the next coming, uh, kind of never really grew into that body, never was quite ready to play that position of cornerback. And frankly, Penn State moved to recruiting 6-1 guys to play 
cornerback, and, and he did not quite, quite fit that mold. But I think good to see him in that mix. And honestly, this is a very deep team that we're talking about. The only thing I'll say is uh, shame not to see Micah Parsons on the depth chart for returning kicks. We thought we were going to see it, and I still think we'll see it in the game. But on paper, Micah Parsons, relegated to linebacker. Can't believe it. We'll talk more on the other side, but the only other quick thing to mention, Jordan Stout, 85% touchback perspective, a transfer from Virginia Tech. He's going to take kickoffs. Pinnegar kicking field goals. And then uh, and then from a punting perspective, the best there is possibly in the country, though he struggled down the stretch last year. Blake Gillikin, I look for him to have a big bounce back year. So it's a long blitz, but we'll come back to the studio in just a few minutes, talk more Penn State football. Bob Long, Tyler Gellhouse, live from Bluebell. This is Bob Long Sports. Dunphy Ford is Mayfair's neighborhood Ford store. Nobody knows your neighborhood like Dunphy Ford. Nearly 40 years. Right here on Frankfurt Avenue. Generation after generation, our neighbors continue to be our customers. We have access to the cars and trucks you want with financing you need. Dumpy Ford is Northeast Philly's first choice for America's number one brand. 7700 Frankfurt Avenue in Mayfair. Online at www.dumpyford.com. Come experience the Dumpy difference. You'll be glad you did. One of the most important relationships a business can have is with its commercial banker. This is Bob Long, and when I'm not broadcasting sports, I'm servicing my clients and building relationships with prospective clients. Whether now is the time to grow through capital investment, to drive operational efficiencies, or to leave a legacy through succession planning, I can be a resource to guide you through the process. Bob Long, a commercial banker in the greater Philadelphia area, where my goal is to help your business grow. What does your character look like? Does it bounce back after each setback? Does it stand out by standing up? Does it make good on good intentions? Character is invisible until it's not. Only through action will the world know what it's made of, what you're made of. Find out how you can strengthen the character of your community alongside empowered veterans and families of the fallen at travismanion.org. I chose CCM because I have found that this company, um, on the level of scaling that we have here, the volume that we are doing, to truly have every department head and employee fully engaged in the mission of the company to make it an originator focused, uh, production first uh, company. I have not found that anywhere I've worked and I've worked at one of the largest banks in the world down to the smallest tiny community bank and correspondent lender. No one has been able to consistently deliver that message. Welcome back inside the show, everybody. Thanks for being here with us. Bob Long, Tyler Gellhouse, live from the Bluebell Studios here for Bob Long Sports. Now, you did uh, correct me on one thing. It's exactly right. I don't know where I was thinking. Catcher as a linebacker, not a senior, so a young guy. But still, I would say surprised that uh, Lance Dixon, with all his hype coming in, beats out the sophomore. Yeah, I think um, it might be kind of like a just he's still a freshman type of thing. Um, I think you're definitely going to see Lance Dixon uh, this season as well as Brandon Smith. In fact, they were one of the few, um, I would say maybe about eight freshmen that were green-lighted, as Franklin likes to call it, is mm -hmm. good to go to play this year. I mean, Lance Dixon and Brandon Smith were two five-star linebacker recruits um, for the 2019 cycle. So these guys are guys that are going to play. But at the same time, this linebacker room is back to linebacker U standards. Um, I mean, you look at the depth at each position – 
I mean, behind Jan Johnson in the middle, you have a guy like Ellis Brooks, who when he played last year played very well in the middle. Um, outside, as you talked about, Jesse Loquetta was a four-star recruit with Micah Parsons in that class, and he, he's getting his first start on Saturday because Cam Brown suspended for the first half. So it's going to be interesting to see what guys like Luketta um, and Ellis Brooks and, and Dixon and Smith to see what their roles are potentially in backup roles because these are guys that they want on the field. These are tremendous athletes. These are really, really good linebackers. And the depth at Penn State right now at linebacker is really as good as it's been in a while. Yes, yes it has. I couldn't agree with that anymore. And when we think about freshmen and general newcomers as a team, let, let's not limit it to freshmen. We can talk about young sophomores, right? right. Redshirt sophomores. Guys, I mean, when we think about the linebacking core and the wide receivers, and actually the running backs as well, those are three of the youngest positions on the roster and arguably the three most skilled positions on the roster. They definitely are, and – there are young faces, and it's it's going to only take a matter of time until people know who these guys are. Um, but there there is a lot of talent on the team, uh, a lot of young guys that were very highly ranked recruits coming out of high school, whether it was this year, last year, two years ago, that are yep. scratching the surface and, frankly, should be ready to go. Um, you know, the one that I'm actually most interested in seeing, um, outside of a Rashid Walker who is going to have – the target on his back, as you mentioned earlier, is a redshirt freshman left tackle. Opposite him on the defensive line is Jason Owe. Mm -hmm. I've heard nothing but great yep. things. Um, think Aaron may have been a couple. I guess we're going back probably about 10 years now. Um, edge rusher, and I think he's a little more than edge rusher. And I think he's actually a better athlete than Aaron Maben was. This guy isn't going to start, as we mentioned. It's going to be Tony and Itor Grismatos, who were two phenomenal players, but Jason Owe has been getting a lot of publicity. Uh, he runs like a 4-4-40. He's a defensive end. He's like 250 pounds, 6'5". I mean, the full package. So um, very interested to see what he brings to the table this year. Absolutely. And it's one of those things where whether he has that role this year, he will be there in spurts. He will be there on third down. And they're going to expect him to be the guy next year. Because I'll tell you what, enjoy Uter Gross Matos while you have him. He's gone next year without any shadow of a doubt off to the NFL first-round draft pick. And uh, the type of year that he can have if he plays as well as he can, he can be disruptive in the way that Chase Young is going to be disruptive at Ohio State. He can be on those award lists at right. the end of the year as the top defensive end in the country. And, and frankly, in a league like the Big Ten, where offensive lines are, generally speaking, quite talented – and quite strong, it's going to be incumbent upon this defensive line to disrupt that of the other offenses, which is going to make a guy like Garrett Taylor in the secondary who likes to be aggressive and take chances and go after interceptions. He's going to be more successful that way. Yeah, I mean, the defensive line, the whole defense is a strength to Penn State. Um, I've heard over and over again it's the fastest defense they've had in years, maybe ever. Um, this is a ball hawking defense. Um, this defense should keep them in every game. Obviously, it's going to take a little bit for the offense to get clicking, we think, with a new quarterback, a lot of new guys. Talented, like we said. The defense has experience. They should keep them in every game. Defensive line, the pressure, they can rotate guys throughout the game. Um, it makes the linebackers' jobs easier. It makes the corners, the safeties. Every, it's a trickle-down effect. Um, and then not to mention, you, know, you, have, you have passing situations, third and long. I mean, you can put Tony and Owe outside – and you can slide Etor Gross Matos in the middle, not to mention you can still blitz Micah Parsons. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's going to be dangerous for other teams. Um, at the same time, however, as you mentioned, Penn State's going to be going against some very good defensive lines, and that's why the offensive line, specifically um, Rasheed Walker, they're going to have their work cut out for him. I mean, he's going to go against Chase Young at Ohio State, A.J. Espenzia at Iowa, uh, Michigan State, Kenny Willekes. I mean, they all have really good defensive lines, and – that's where these games are won in the trenches. These these big, big games are won in the trenches. Yep. So what do you think for Penn State? I know we're not going to necessarily predict the record, but let me ask a different question. It's been one I've been musing for a long time, and I think people are avoiding the subject maybe because everybody talked about it as soon as it happened. 
we talk about Penn State as a team that has the pieces, but they need to uh, be consistent at spots where we're not sure exactly what we're going to see, right? Let's call it out, the quarterback. Let's call it out, the wide receivers who struggled last year. If Tommy Stevens was in that room and was the starting quarterback right now, and I know this is totally counterproductive, uh, would you predict this team to have more wins than you will with Sean Clifford as the starter? You know, it's it's tough to say because when Tommy Stevens is a runner, is phenomenal. We really never saw him too That's much right. as a passer. And, yep. and we haven't seen Clifford as a passer too much either outside of the mop-up duty or an injury here and there to Therese McSorley. But I'll tell you what, when he came in, his balls are on the money. I mean, he can throw the long ball. He makes good decisions. Um, as you mentioned earlier, he's sneaky athletic. And Mississippi State and Tommy Stevens are playing well. They're going to start second-guessing the decision um, to not name him a starter and have him stick around. Yeah, it's very interesting there. I, I don't know the answer to um, that question that I just posed. What I will say is I think for the long term, Penn State is better off with Sean Clifford is their quarterback right now. And and I would agree with that because um, you're, you're transitioning off of a three-year starter. Actually, two three-year starters. You had Hackenberg, three years. McSorley, three years. Hypothetically, you could have Clifford for three years. Obviously, you don't know. I mean, look at Dwayne Haskins last year was a redshirt sophomore for Ohio State. One and done pretty much. He started one year, killed it first round pick in the NFL mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's going to be Clifford but you just never know obviously he could be the quarterback for three years um but I think with a younger team I think it just makes sense to get the ball rolling um that way with the majority of people coming back already for 2020 they're used to it they're not breaking in another quarterback I sure. think that had a lot to do with it yeah no it's it's so true and uh last point on Tommy is I, it's actually I think an unbelievable get for Joe Moorhead, not because I necessarily think he would have been great for Penn State's offense or the perfect fit, but I think he is a rich man's Nick Fitzgerald in many senses. Guy he worked with last year, a guy who played there for four years, a run first quarterback who can distribute, but it's not his strength. So on the Penn State side, we talk about all the youth that'll be back next year. Those guys are back next year for Penn State in almost every case. So will Sean Clifford. And whether he remains the guy, of course, there are two guys, Taquan Roberson, Michael Johnson Jr., who I think have high expectations for themselves. We'll have a year under the program. And if we've learned anything from James Franklin, it is an open quarterback battle. But in theory, Sean Clifford getting this experience now, whether it's eight wins, nine wins, or 12 wins, I think will help Penn State going into next year and put him in a really good spot uh, yeah, to I succeed. Couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, um, I don't want to think about 2020 yet. But um, it, it could shape up for something special with that decision that was made at the quarterback room. But I think he's going to bring it in 2019. I'm really looking forward to see what Clifford and the rest of the Nittany Lions can do this year. So next up for us is going to be our picks. We're going to make college football playoff picks first. We're going to bring Tyler Kern on from LaSalle College High School Football Broadcasting. And we're going to get his first picks, our first guest picker of the year. And that's going to be a lot of fun as we close out the show. Plenty more to come here. A lot of time until we get to 8 o'clock. We'll quickly wrap the rest of college football across the country. And then we'll bring you more here from the Nittany Lions Sports Report. He's Tyler. I'm Bob. We'll be right back here on Bob Long Sports. Thanks again for being with us. Ford is Mayfair's neighborhood Ford store. Nobody knows your neighborhood like Dunphy Ford. Nearly 40 years. Right here on Frankfurt Avenue. Generation after generation. Our neighbors continue to be our customers. We have access to the cars and trucks you want with financing you need. Dumpy Ford is Northeast Philly's first choice for America's number one brand. 7700 Frankfurt Avenue in Mayfair. Online at www.dumpyford.com. Come experience the Dumpy difference. You'll be glad you did.
One of the most important relationships a business can have is with its commercial banker. This is Bob Long, and when I'm not broadcasting sports, I'm servicing my clients and building relationships with prospective clients. Whether now is the time to grow through capital investment, to drive operational efficiencies, or to leave a legacy through succession planning, I can be a resource to guide you through the process. Bob Long, a commercial banker in the greater Philadelphia area, where my goal is to help your business grow. What does your character look like? Does it bounce back after each setback? Does it stand out by standing up? Does it make good on good intentions? Character is invisible until it's not. Only through action will the world know what it's made of, what you're made of. Find out how you can strengthen the character of your community alongside empowered veterans and families of the fallen at travismanion.org. I chose CCM because I have found that this company, um, on the level of scaling that we have here, the volume that we are doing, to truly have every department head and employee fully engaged in the mission of the company to make it an originator focused, uh, production first uh, company. I have not found that anywhere I've worked and I've worked at one of the largest banks in the world down to the smallest tiny community bank and correspondent lender. No one has been able to consistently deliver that message. LaSalle is dynamic. Prepared. Active. Welcome back, everybody, inside the Nittany Lions Sports Report live from Bluebell, Pennsylvania. Bob Long, Tyler Galehouse. Very shortly, we will have Tyler Kern of the LaSalle College High School football broadcast team on with us to be the first, the inaugural guest picker. Excited for that. But, Tyler, before we do that, a lot more going on in college football beyond Penn State. Will Penn State factor into the mix when we talk about a college football play of only time will tell, but let's talk about the rest of the teams that may factor in. What are the biggest things you're looking forward to coming into this college football season, and how do you see the college football playoff shaping up? Well, I think first and foremost that everybody that's picking their playoff has the two teams of Alabama and Clemson, and it's hard to argue um, to not have them in there. I mean, they have been the teams of the last – Five plus years, really. Um, they played for the last couple of national championships outside of the Georgia Alabama game a couple of years ago. They really are the two um, dominant teams, and there's other close teams to that. Oklahoma, Georgia's right there nowadays. Um, Ohio State. They've been the five teams that have consistently made it um, to the college football playoff and have, have have made serious runs at it. But Clemson and Alabama are in a league of their own almost mm -hmm. right now. Um, oh yeah. So almost. Uh, in terms of the college football playoff, what I'm looking at, you're going to have those two teams in, and then most likely you're going to have those two teams play for the championship. Uh, although it would be exciting to have another team or another two teams in there. Um, I am going to say uh, that the Big Ten will get a team in this year after being left out the last couple. Um, I think that the Pac-12 gets left out this year, and I think the Big 12 champ and the Big Ten champ are in, along with Clemson and Alabama. Um, now with those teams being in, it's, it's kind of funny. It's like you're in, but now you have to play Clemson, or Alabama, which is doable to win, but it's tough. Uh, chances are they'd be playing one of those two teams. Uh, my playoff, uh, I know this isn't going to sit well with a lot of people. I have Clemson one, Bama two, 
At three, I have Michigan. Um, I just think that their schedule sets up kind of nice for them. Uh, they have Ohio State at home. They have Michigan State at home. They have Notre Dame at home. They do travel to Penn State. I'm not saying that they're going to beat Penn State. I don't think that um, Michigan's going to go undefeated. I don't think the Big Ten champ is going to go undefeated, but I do think that they will make the playoff. I think they're going to beat each other up a little bit. At the end of the day, I think that Michigan will come out of the Big Ten, will make it to the playoff, and I have the Big 12 champ of Texas making mm. the playoff as a four spot. Um, they got hot as the year went on last year, returned to quarterback Ellinger, um, have some weapons around him. Colin Johnson, a big receiver, six foot six on the outside. Uh, a lot of guys back there. Um, so that's my playoff. Clemson, Alabama, Michigan, and um, Texas, and Clemson, Alabama for the title. I think Alabama uh, regained supremacy this year. Um, motivation from this, um, the dominating Clemson efforts of last year and Trevor Lawrence. So many questions. So many questions about Texas that we don't have time to address here on this one. We'll have to do that over the course of the year. Okay, so for me, I like Alabama and Clemson. That's fine. In whatever order you like, one, two. I think that the winner of the Georgia-Notre Dame game in September will go to the college football playoff. Now, I happen to think that Georgia will win that game. So I'm going to put the Bulldogs in there. But but I do think that Notre Dame with Ian Book back at on the offensive side, yes, Julian Love is gone, but they do return a lot of strong guys on defense. And I think that their schedule sets up well. You mentioned that about Michigan. I think the schedule sets up well for Notre Dame. They're going to catch Georgia early, right, as they're about to look into their deep SEC schedule. They're going to catch Michigan. Yes, Michigan, they have to go to the road on both of those games. But – I don't know what this Michigan team is going to be this year. I do think they're good enough to go to the playoff. And if, if Notre Dame loses both of those games, you could easily see Georgia and Michigan filling out the, the final four there. But I, I do think that Notre Dame is looking like a team that could run through the rest of that schedule and have two big games. Yes, both on the road. Yes, against big-time contenders. But, but there they are, and a team that got, I think, a really bad rep for the way they lost to Clemson last year. Let's look past that. They had a tremendous year. They have a very efficient quarterback. They have a good offense. They need to replace the running back, but they usually have a stable running backs over there, and I think they're really solid this year. That said, my final pick, so I have Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, and then I actually do like Ryan Day and Ohio State to find a way. Yeah, I think that, well, first and foremost, Bob's wife did go to Notre Dame, so it sounds like he's <laughs> trying to get some brownie points if he has There me. you go. Now, I am looking at the Notre Dame schedule. You're right. Their two toughest games are on the road at top ten teams, Georgia, Michigan. Besides that, um, though. Besides that, they do have Stanford as well at, on the road and at the Southern, end of the year. And they got Southern Cal, um, of course. Yeah, uh, they host UVA, which is a, a very improved team, by the way. They are. Um, they it's are. not an easy schedule. It's actually a pretty difficult road schedule, if we're being honest. Um but you, no, I mean, absolutely. But it was I mean, difficult in the way that last year's road game at Virginia Tech was difficult. A, a game that on paper looks like it could be tough, but a team that's good enough to go to the college football playoff, uh, amongst other games that right. aren't quite as difficult, should be able to get up for, I right. guess is the way I'd phrase yeah, it. Yeah, no, I mean, it, you, they very well could, but at the same time, if they lose to Georgia, no room for error for the months of October and November. They have to win every game. A two-loss team to make it, you have to have a championship game, and you have to win your championship. Yep. Can't get in with more than two losses, so I think that would hurt Notre Dame in that aspect. And Ohio State, I think it's kind of the same thing with me with with Michigan. Um, I don't see a Big Ten team with one loss being left out, even for whatever reason. They all beat up on each other and have two losses, and they're the champ. You know, a lot of people are talking Oregon out in the Pac-12. They have an incredibly difficult road schedule. I don't have it in front of me right now, but it is it is road heavy. Um, so Oregon, a lot of people like them with Justin Herbert being back. Um, they have a tough test, tough tough test this weekend, as we'll talk about soon with Auburn um, down at uh, Arlington um, and at Cowboys Stadium, AT and T Stadium. And so right off the bat, you're going to know a lot about Oregon, but I think their schedule is just too difficult, and I think everyone's just sleeping on the Pac-12. Um, just haven't been real relevant recently. Yeah. So. Uh, Unfortunately, we're both going with a Big Ten team, neither Penn State. Um, now, I wouldn't I wouldn't be shocked if Penn State – I think you could put in any of those three teams with Ohio State and Michigan having a better chance. 
But I really wouldn't be shocked if Penn State won the Big Ten. And I don't even think you have to beat Michigan and Ohio State to do so. I think you'd have to split and take care of business with the rest. Everything else should work itself out, I think. So there are picks for the college football playoff, and we have one more segment left on the show here tonight. So excited to bring our first guest picker on here tonight, Tyler Kern of the LaSalle College Football, uh, LaSalle College High School Football Broadcast Team. He's the color commentator. I'm happy to share the booth with him. And let's take a listen at the game on Saturday night of which Tyler was a part. Empty set as Sutton Christian steps up in the pocket, throws on the run, good catch there, and he makes one miss. That's Deshaun Seals off to the races. Cuts it back and now steps out of bounds in the high school football season. Sutton Christian steps up. Can't make it one miss. Timothy Barrett in there on the stop. Yes. On the roster as well, so wide receiver, maybe see that connection at some point this year. That is a booming punt. Brings Seals to the other side of midfield. He has a lane to the outside. Ooh. Two huge blocks there by Imhotep. And Seals makes another one miss at the 25-yard line. Will Robinson back into the game alongside Jalen Sutton Christian, the quarterback, who takes the shotgun snap. Steps up in the pocket, floats one. What a catch there by Deshaun Steals, stepping out of bounds. They need the four for a first down. Ooh. Keeping it up the middle, untouched to the end zone. Touchdown. Play action. Savage, great Ooh. defensive play there. All right, so there's a little snippet of our uh, broadcast there. And here he is, Tyler Kern, our guest here this evening. Thanks for being here with us, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's my, it is my pleasure. It's good to see the Bob Long Sports headquarters. <laughs> yes, that's right. We bunker ourselves <laughs> yeah, in here. The Bluebell like, headquarters. I think, I, yeah. <laughs> that's I, think right. I consider this to be like a promotion. Like I finally got out of the booth and into <laughs> the headquarters. <laughs> well, we're glad you can make it out. So walk us through. And that's a big part of why we're doing this. We want to bring guests on and tell their story a little bit. In this case, it's your career at LaSalle from a football perspective, and now you're able to come back, give back to the school, and, and be part of the broadcast team that has you know, infiltrated, in, in a good way, a, a lot of homes and such in, in Philadelphia and beyond, teams that, you know, folks that like to follow this team. And so if you could, just a, a few yeah, of words. Of course. Um so, I mean, I graduated class 2012 from LaSalle, um, played all four years of uh, football there. Um, kind of wasn't a starter until my senior year, but they got to play under some great players, defensive end. Um, Steve Sinnott, Joe Nagy, to name a few. They were, uh, they were all Catholic as well. Um, uh, worked on, Actually, our defensive coordinator at the time was John Steinmetz, who's actually the head coach of LaSalle now. Um, and then uh, graduated, uh, went to Drexel, didn't pursue football. Um, and obviously Drexel does not have a football team, so <laughs> I haven't really been on the college football bandwagon too much. So uh, I might not be the most um, knowledgeable expert pick here, but uh, I'm going to give it my, my best. You will be the most energetic and the <laughs> most dedicated picker, though. And yeah, let's go. It's and all luck anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And if you do well, you're going to get Bob Long Sports swag at the end of the year. You only got to beat 13 other people over the court or more if we – Continue doing shows here, but uh, that's what we have in front of us. So, Can't wait. Uh, big game this Friday, though, for the LaSalle Explorers against North Penn on the road at Crawford Stadium. That's a game that you were a part of for a long time, right? Or yeah. That started back when that you were playing, right? That was my junior right? year, uh, 20, uh, 2010. Yep. Yeah. That we started playing them. Um, I remember that first year, game um, my junior year. They, uh, It was a good fight. But then in the playoffs, we met them, and it was like a – Throwing punches back and forth. I remember. Um, was that game at PW by any chance? Yes. I, I was at that. Was that was insane. a heck of a game. There was yeah, a lot it was of great. There. Um, I remember uh, they, it was sealed. Uh, Joe Nagy blocked the uh, the pass, and Ryan Geiger caught it for the interception, and it sealed the game. And it was a uh, it was intense. We went on to the state championship that year as well. Uh, did not win it that year, but um, and that rivalry kind of continued. Um, my senior year, that first game was tough. Uh, we were kind of throwing punches with that as well, and they can, then we kind of pulled away towards the end. And then uh, we played them again in the state semifinals, and they actually – that was their first win against us. It was, what, 21-14, I think. Mm. That was a defensive battle the whole game. And uh, and the rivalry seemed to continue since. I mean, I, I remember last year it was a fun game to watch. They're, I mean, it's always entertaining. And 
Yeah, thank you. No, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you what do you expect for this week's game? I liked what I saw from LaSalle. Machida really stepped up as mm-hmm. quarterback. Um, they showed some good stuff. Uh, Sam Brown, running back. Uh, I, honestly, offense looked like they're starting to click. And that defense looked good. Imitep had some raw talent. Um, and uh, and their uh, quarterback Christian McLeod. I remember, like I said, raw talent. I, I wasn't sure how much their game planning was, but I think North Penn will be North Penn will be a lot more disciplined and it'll be a really good challenge. Yeah, they have about three running backs that they can put out there at any given time. Yeah. And they're going to put a lot of different formations out there. You know, you, I mean, you remember playing against them. Dick Beck, the thing doesn't really change. Uh, a lot of, a lot of power eye, a lot of rhino formation where you're misdirecting and putting three, three guys in the backfield all lined up in a variety of ways. It's, it's going to be interesting, and it's going to be important for that LaSalle defense to stay in their gaps. But I think it has a chance to be a really good football game. Agreed. North Penn put up 55 against Neshaminy, so mm-hmm. we, we could see ourselves a good game between two really good football teams. Wow. Check in. Bob but Long Sports. There you go. Bob Long Sports is where you watch it, on YouTube, on the website, or on Twitter, or Facebook. But the reason we're here tonight, Tyler, the reason is to get you on the board Let's from go. a picks perspective. <laughs> so. Uh, as we mentioned, swag on the line. You can be and will be the clubhouse leader no matter what here. <laughs> so let's put a good score up there. Tyler has our game All scores. right, here we go. We have pick em, five games every week, picking head-to-head winners. Um, the Penn State game every, every week will be the spread. Um, so you either take Penn State to cover or not cover, essentially. So we are going to start off, um, as we mentioned earlier, I believe it's a 7.30 start. AT&T Stadium in Dallas, Texas. Neutral site, Oregon versus Auburn. I got Auburn. That's it, huh? That's it. Yeah. That's, he's got Auburn. <laughs> That's, no, no explanation <laughs> needed for any of it. That's brilliant. That is uh, brilliant. That sounds confident. He no, sounds I think, confident. I think Auburn covers the spread. Don't even have to worry about oh, the spread yeah, for okay. them. I, it's straight just up. straight oh, up head to head for the. I'm not gonna lie. Like I said, my knowledge is limited. I check the uh, the odds on each of these games, and that's wow. what I'm going. There you off. go. There you go. <laughs> so you're going all Br- brutally honest. How about you, Bob? I like Oregon in that game, uh, and it's a game. It's a great game. It's why you schedule it at AT and T Stadium. It's why you you send a team from the West Coast and a team from the South, and you. you Meet them up in Texas. Makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that Oregon has a chance to be a very good team this year. Obviously, the quarterback, I'm going to take Oregon with Justin Herbert. Uh, Gus Malzahn, Hot big seat. time year for him. Hot seat. With a really difficult schedule. Very, actually, probably the toughest schedule in America. Yep. I would be very surprised if Auburn is a ranked team by the end of the year. You have this game and then the slog that is the SEC West, a tough road schedule for them this year. I like Oregon in that game. I, I'm going to go I'm gonna go with the Ducks as well. Um, Justin Herbert really would have been a top-10 quarterback, top-10 draft pick probably if he had come out. Um, they're loaded on offensive line. They have skilled guys. Auburn's defensive line should keep them in the game. Um, from what I've read, they're the top defensive line in the country. Um I think they're rolling out a true freshman quarterback, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think his name is Bo Nix. Um, so anytime you're rolling a true freshman quarterback out at any time, regardless uh, what's at stake, this game's played at at t Stadium, nationally televised, biggest game of the weekend. I'm going to take the Ducks. I like it. Our second pick, um, I believe it's another neutral site in Jacksonville, Florida, but closer to Florida State. Uh, we have Boise State making the cross-country trip to take on the Seminoles. Hmm. I think I got Boise here, and uh, again, no rhyme or reason. I'm just sticking to it, Boise. Broncos, huh? <laughs> he likes blue and orange. <laughs> Auburn, <Yeah>. Boise. <laughs> yeah, I'm sensing a trend. <laughs> Boy, that is tough. That is tough. Does Florida State come back this year? Blackman Jr. at the quarterback. Do we like that? Uh, I think I like the Broncos with Tyler. I'm going go. with Tyler Kern here. I don't know that I trust Taggart. I know that I don't trust Blackman Jr., and I encourage and look forward to him proving me wrong. But until then, game like this, neutral site, Boise State, not the same coach, none of the same players. However, Zabransky isn't there anymore. Yeah, no. (laughs) Ian Johnson. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, But traditionally, it's been a program that has been ready to go week one. Florida State, not so much. 
Uh, we're going to make this a clean sweep. I'm going to take Boise State, too, um, for the reasons you guys mentioned. I Florida State, they've had the athletes, but they just – Willie Taggart just hasn't put it together. He's on the hot seat um, at Florida State, only entering year two, I believe. And That's right. The seat is hot. Um, well, there's hanging a, in there and, against and, Sanford is, and both it won't these, do you well. <laughs> both, these, both these teams are unranked, and then all the pressure's on Florida State. The game's right around the corner in Jacksonville. Um, Boise State has that nothing to lose mentality. You know, we've seen the trick plays years ago, but that's just still kind of who they are. Like, don't be surprised to see the gimmick stuff. I think they take advantage of Florida State, Florida State's mistakes, penalties, turnovers. Boise State wins a close one. I like it. Our next game, we're going to go out to uh, Palo Alto, California. We have a battle of the smarty pants. We have Northwestern traveling to Stanford. No blue and orange. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. This makes it such a dilemma. I'm yeah. going to uh, go with Stanford. Battle of the uh, smarty pants. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's about all They're I can do. They might be a little smarter at Stanford. <laughs> Not much, but Stanford is in a, it, it's very up there in a league of its own almost. We apologize to all our Northwestern viewers. The Northwestern of- is still the flagship of the Big Ten in terms of academics. <laughs> the opinions of Tyler Gellhouse do not necessarily reflect that of Bob Long Sports. <laughs> He signed a waiver. <laughs> yes. I uh, I like Stanford in that game as well. Northwestern obviously had a tremendous year last year. Went all the way to the Big Ten Championship. They were also in a tremendous division to get to a championship game with a slightly better than average year. Uh, with that said, I think Stanford is going to be good this year. Strong contender up there in the north. And I think will – not that this game is going to affect that at all, obviously – uh, this, the only game this the only thing this game would affect is if they do do well in the north, could they find themselves as a one loss team come the end of the year and think about a fringe college football playoff? I think they put themselves in that position early. I think they fall off late and end up as a two or three loss team. But I got Stanford in this one against Northwestern. Tyler, you took Stanford as well. I it's a tough one because North. Anytime you go to the West Coast, it's it seems to have a really bad effect on these teams. You see it a, a lot of the time when a Big Ten team goes to the Rose Bowl and the Rose Bowl champ or the Rose Bowl uh, opponent is usually from the Pac-12 and they usually are better suited because of the time difference and stuff. Northwestern has a transfer quarterback who sat out last year by the name of Hunter Johnson. He was a top-rated recruit for quarterbacks, one of the top-rated recruits a couple years ago, went to Clemson, was beat out by a guy by the name of Trevor Lawrence and transferred to Northwestern, sat out last year. He, he's a really good quarterback, and people are going to start to find out about him. I think Northwestern's going to go in there and pull up the minor upset of number 25, Stanford. And I think that Northwestern is a team to watch out for in the Big Ten West this year. I like it. I like that. Good insight, it's Tyler. bold. <laughs> uh, our next game is an ACC versus ACC matchup to start the season. We have the Hokies of Virginia Tech. Traveling north to Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, to take on Boston College. Virginia Tech. That ain't no That's guess. It. That's what it's going to be. Confidence. <laughs> uh, I like Virginia Tech here as well. Boston College did have a bit of a resurgence last year. Uh, I just do think the Hokies, generally speaking, have better talent. Mm-hmm. They had a down year last year, but I think they find a way to win this football game. I just think it has a chance to be a really good one. The only question, the only question I have about this game, what are they going to do without Jordan Stout kicking it out of the back of the end zone? That's true. (laughs) He'll he'll be doing it for us. Um, This is a tough one, too. Um, I'm going to go Virginia Tech as well. I know that Boston College is going to run the ball with Hillman. Um, He's one of the better backs in the country. Um, But Virginia Tech, I think, will make enough plays in the end. I think you're going to be looking at a low-scoring game here. on the road makes it more difficult for Virginia Tech, but I do think they pull it out. Um, and I think it's a great game, but in the end, Virginia Tech does win. And um, with that, we're going to have our last head-to-head pick. We're going to stay in the ACC versus ACC. UVA, who's been getting a lot of praise this year um, to possibly win either the Coastal or Atlantic, I can't keep them straight, but opposite of Clemson, um, is traveling to Pitt um, to start the season. So UVA at Pitt. Based off that, Tyler, I gotta go with UVA. I mean, they're the, the bright star and whatever the opposite of Clemson <laughs> they, is. <laughs> right now, they, they are they are getting a lot of love, but you never know, man. First games are crazy. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's Especially the, when it's a conference game. What are the colors? You got blue and gold. No, you got, no well, pit, oh yeah, pit, 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 right? Yeah. Okay. And you know Virginia's colors. Oh, I blue think you know, yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> UVA. UVA. Cavaliers. I, I, I know that. I'm not gonna lie, and it's just it's a trend. It's something's clicking with the blue and it's, orange. It's clicking. It uh, Pitt way down this year. I think they struggle big time. UVA, I think they 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 they're really sneaky this year, and they find their way in the back end of the top 25. By the you know not necessarily they they may be there even in the middle of the season, but I think at the end of the season, at the end of the ACC schedule, they're gonna be. Kind of a 20 to 25 ranked team. Sure, sure. And not to mention, Pitt's probably already looking ahead to two weeks, three weeks uh, from now when they take on Penn State in the Super Bowl for Pitt. So, um, now I think it's – you guys have made good points. Virginia, um, they are the better team. Um, You know, what scares me, though, and why I think it's a a tight spread is because first game of the year on the road, not that it's a daunting environment by any means, but on the road against a conference opponent. Um, You just – you don't know what you're getting week one. Um, and but I, I do think UVA pulls it out, and I think that they're going to have a very impressive year and ultimately um, earn the right to get smoked by Clemson in the ACC championship. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that being said, uh, we did mention that the Penn State game will be based off the spread every week uh, because obviously the show is geared towards Penn State, um, and obviously it should be an easy guess that Penn State would beat Idaho. So we're going to throw the line at you. Um, Penn State is 37 and a half point favorites over Idaho. Question is, does Penn State cover the spread and win by more than that? Or do they not cover? It's a tough one, you know, like, uh, I mean, this is a Penn State show, so I want to appease the people. Uh, but that's, that's quite <laughs> but the But you're spread. playing with people's that's, money, too, because people spread. are going to take what you're saying seriously. Right. So God, They shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> There's no blue and orange teams here. <laughs> uh that's my expertise, but I'm going to go and say that they cover that spread. First game of the season, come out swinging, explosive start, you know, destroy a small school. <laughs> <laughs> Build the confidence. <laughs> Not just a small school, an FCS school. Not yeah, just we, an FCS school, an FCS school that was under 500 last Right, year. yeah, th- and I don't think that you can even schedule FCS games anymore, but it was done so long ago yep. that they were able to pull it off, so... I like Penn State to cover that. I do. And I say it because over the last three years or so, James Franklin, when there have been games like this, has been last, able to get his team ready. Yeah. Well, yeah, Georgia last year State. Was, last year, Appalachian State was scary, though. Well, but that's okay, a different but animal. That's a good team. That, yeah. It's no, a top absolutely. 25 team for most of the year. I'm talking the Akrons of the world, the Georgia States of the world. Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they run this team out of the building, which isn't crazy to say. I think they win it somewhere in the range of sixty-three to three or something. I, I think you it's know that what? bad. They're they're gonna cover. Um, I think it's actually a relatively easy call to make. I don't see how Idaho even scores a touchdown unless there's a bad turnover, um, a big special teams play, something along those lines. I don't see Idaho driving on Penn State. Um, at least when Penn State has their starters in, um, so you know I think they're going to cover. I, I would I'm leaning towards like a, a 52 to three type of game. So right yep. there with you, or 52 to six, maybe two field goals. I don't I don't really see how Idaho does cover, but that's what makes it interesting. Vegas is usually spot on, but um, we're all taking Penn State to cover. Um, hopefully you guys do too, and um, win some money off of it. I, I feel like my thought and my st- statement on James Franklin, you know, even O'Brien, and again, O'Brien was only here for a couple of years, but but back to Paterno, I, I do feel as if um, <laughs> me taking a 37-point cover never would have happened oh, on a Paterno. God just, no. just because you're running the it would ball. Be, it would be sh- probably like 35-3. to three, Right. You know, yep. like, yeah. Something like that. But Franklin – I mean, the game of football has changed. His offensive yeah. coordinators are throwing the ball. And, and I just think from an athleticism perspective, they so dominate these teams. And, and in this day in college football, you can't be afraid to run up a score. I mean, I'm not saying throw bombs in the fourth quarter when you're up by 50. But, you know, these guys, are, as we talked about earlier, young guys, they gotta get they got to get their reps in. Yep. Um, coaches, too. They don't want to take their foot off the gas because they've seen what happens the last couple years 
against the big guys, the Ohio States, Michigan State a couple times. Take yep. your foot off the gas. doesn't take much. You lose a game. So, um, you know, I, I think that they have a lot to prove, and, and I'm not saying you got to run up the score, but take care of business, and, and they should cover quite easily, I think. Tyler. Thanks wow. for being here, man. Thanks. I'm glad I was able to provide my expert college football insight. And we'll see how he does next week when yes, we, we will, will. Uh, release, um, show everybody the results from week one of college football. We can't wait to do it. Yes. I look forward to my Bob Long Sports socks. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's what we're looking for. Anything else you'd like to say to the LaSalle faithful or the Bob Long Sports faithful or anything else? I mean, tune in Friday night. What, 7 p.m., is it? 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Uh, definitely. He's going to be there Sal on time. It's going to be great. North Penn Nights. Hopefully it doesn't pour this year. <laughs> I'm bringing an umbrella just in case. That was brutal last year. Yeah, it's going to be uh, – I think it's going to be a good game. Tyler, we were outside last year, uh, outside of the press box, and it was pouring rain oh for God. the entire time. We had to Weather s- looks good. I just checked. 85 we, uh, and sunny. <laughs> we sealed the tent – we had our man Alex doing camera halfway outside the tent, unfortunately. Oh boy. You say we, but you got there way earlier and did all the setup. And yeah. I was like, how did you do oh, this? Man. It, was, it, it was It was wild. Miserable. Multiple trips to I think the car. I think you're good, though, for this year. Good. good. Not good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be there or be on Bob Long Sports. Yeah. That's right. Those are the options. They, they <laughs> The only two. To my Tylers here, both of them. Appreciate your time, guys. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> we'll see everybody next week. It will be another Tuesday night broadcast, given Labor Day. But we'll see you after Idaho, previewing Buffalo, and with a brand new guest picker. Thanks for being with us, everybody, for our first show of the year. Go Nits, and we'll see everybody soon.